Hello everyone, this is Colossius, and I am back with another Go video, and this video is a video that I've been trying to make all of January, but it took me until February to finally get it out, because honestly I struggled quite a bit with uh, the content in this video. So basically it's breaking into SDK. Uh, this was supposed to be a uh, Colossi approach to 10Q video, when um, uh, basically I tried to make the classy approach of 10q all of january and it just, it just i just had really bad luck and it didn't work out uh so this is kind of a follow-up to the classy approach to 15q it's basically the basics you need to get to like uh past 15q down to like 10q or whatnot and this video will basically follow up that on breaking into single digit q <clears throat> so uh, a little bit about what i tried to do was uh, try to just do like I did with the classy approach 15 Q is give myself some rules to follow and uh, try not to do anything too detrimental and I was doing this on Fox Wei Chi for those of you who don't know that is a Chinese Go server and players on there are very very aggressive uh, but you can get away with just basics and still win the issue became that I was winning every game because I was killing something and I didn't want to make a video about that. I didn't want to make a video on how to kill something, at least uh, in that one. But every single time I tried to make it, um, every single game I played pretty much became that they would overplay so much that I had no choice to kill them or I wouldn't have enough points because they would just invade everywhere. And they would get like four or five weak groups. And I'd be trying to force them to live while taking profit, but then they would immediately tanuki the group that can be killed to take my profit and then I had no choice but to kill something um, and it wasn't what I wanted to go for it wasn't the video I wanted to go for and in one of the games I ended up accidentally winning by like 20 points uh, and that was a blooper video I made on patreon if, for those patrons uh, that are watching this uh, he actually tried he actually had three times that he could have died and then I let him live all three times and I just tried to take more points and then I made one little uh, one little mistake trying to just take profit or whatever and I ended up dying and then he made a fourth week group that I had to kill to come back in points and I was like this is not a good tutorial video at all uh, so um, that was that was uh, how the games were going but the first two times I recorded and this is where the bad luck came in the first time I recorded I had the wrong scene object on uh, it was actually the Patreon board, so uh, I can actually see what that would look like. So this is the OGS board, um, and this is the Foxy. Sorry, yeah, this is the Foxy board, and you can see that it doesn't really quite work. And I think actually when I was playing on uh, Foxy, I had the OGS board up, and I was playing on Foxy, and it ended up cutting off like a chunk of the board. So a chunk of the board was actually cut off, and you couldn't even see part of the moves, and it was just not a good video quality and then the second time I did it I forgot to hit the record button so checking now I am recording so uh, I forgot to hit the record button the second time so it was just I tried really hard to get out to you guys and I just kept messing up and the games were just not going great and then finally someone recommended that I pa play on Pandanet if I wanted to make a basics video and <clears throat> I did go to Pandanet to make the basic video, uh, and I did play a couple games of Pandanet, but rather than trying to give myself rules and stuff to follow, I actually just decided to change my approach because it just wasn't working out. Uh, so I changed my approach, and I kind of just played normal. I mean, I didn't go all out, of course, but I also didn't really hold back too, too much. I kind of just wanted to see what would happen if I just played a basic game and just followed my own basics. I didn't try to do anything crazy. I knew I was going to get ahead, so I wasn't worried about uh, trying to judge if I needed to invade somewhere crazy to make a comeback or anything like that. So I didn't do anything super crazy. I just played kind of um, an ideal, not perfect, but an ideal game for, for myself of basics, uh, an ideal basics game for myself. And yes, I won quite easily, um, but that wasn't the point. I did have to sandbag a little bit for these two games. Uh, I wanted to see what 10 Qs were lacking. What is the difference between a 10 Q and me? Because I'm a Don level player and I want to help you guys get to Don level, of course. So I wanted to see what is the difference. And this difference can really help you break into single digit Q, I think. Uh, and I also uh, learned a little something that I think um, 
as a, I learned something as a teacher that I think that I was uh, not putting enough emphasis on, and that was reading. And so at this point, guys, I would encourage you guys to get a notepad and a pen and start taking notes for the rest of this video on things you think would be important. So I do highly encourage you guys taking notes from this video. So there's two games that we're going to go over and uh, a few concepts that I would like to get across to you guys. So the first thing is, is um, there are two sides to our go skill, to go skill, basically. Uh, two sides of the go skill coin. One is the basics, and the basics you can consider like what I talk about, the classy approach. So the classy approach is where's my weakness, where's my opponent's weakness, where's the big move, and then uh, the approach on how to attack, how to, how to defend, and how to make points. Just the classy approach, right? The basics. Um, and the, the basics maybe not as limited to the classy approach. It can be many things, like it's counting, judgment, etc. Uh, and then the second side of that coin is reading. And I think uh, a friend of mine who's also uh, who's also teaching, he was in California, he talked to me about how he only teaches reading. And I realized that I only taught basics. And I think the basics are very strong. The basics can take you to five dawn. But it's true, you have to have a little bit of reading to back it up. And what he taught was pretty much the opposite, was just reading. Because with just reading, you can also get to five dawn. Your basics aren't nearly as good. But if you can outreach your opponent and outfight your opponent, it's going to be very strong and very powerful. And a lot of people actually struggle against these types of uh, these types of players. A very good example of this is if you have played on Tai Jump or Fox Wei Chi at all, then you know exactly what type of players I'm talking about. Those who can just read. And yes, my friend is a Korean, so <laughs> uh, maybe that has something to do with it. If you guys uh, want to think of that or whatever, but I actually took that to heart and I was like okay he's teaching reading and it works uh, I teach the basics and I think it works because this is what I've done many of my students do this and I was wondering if I can implement the both of these and improve myself as a teacher and so I want to start um, saying that the the best ideal way to improve is to have basics and reading and know when to do which and know how to do which so the first note I would uh, recommend you guys really, really understand is if the basics and reading is two sides of the same coin, they basically each do their own thing. So the basics tell you what you should be doing and reading tells you how to do it, right? So I, w I kind of... I kind of mentioned this to many of my students, it just, I use different words. So when I would tell them the basics is what you should be doing, they should, uh, the glossy approach tells you what your goal of that turn is. And then from there you have to improve, you have to uh, improve your efficiency or your effectiveness of accomplishing that goal. And that's what I used to say, right? Now I'm just saying read how to accomplish that goal. And if you can improve your reading, and your understanding of that goal, then you'll get stronger. So I kind of was teaching that in a way, um, but I think I think saying reading will be a more accurate way to say it and also help you guys understand it better. <clears throat> so when I was going through these games, I did notice a very, very distinct lack of reading. And I'm not just saying that because I can read better than they can, I'm saying that there was a distinct uh hopefulness um what is the word i'm looking for uh, optimistic they were uh, there's a lot of optimistic moves and i think a lot of players um probably at this level but maybe at every level have a lot of optimistic moves that are just not being read out and yes yeah, sometimes they work sometimes they don't but you need to understand the difference and you need to understand um, if they actually work or not. Just reading will really help you make a decision uh, on whether you should play something or not. And I think you'll see that a lot in these games. So try to really, really avoid those optimistic moves that you haven't read out. You really gotta read, guys. You really gotta read all these things out. And yes, I always stress play the basics. You should always stick to the basics to understand what you're doing. And in this game, you'll see that I try my best to do that. Um, but you need to back up the basics of reading. So the basics are what you should be doing. If you're, it doesn't matter how much you read, well, is unless it's doing something crazy and your opponent messes up, but it doesn't really matter how much you read if you're not doing the basics, but it doesn't matter how good your basics are if your opponent just outreads you everywhere and breaks into everything and destroys your shape, right? 
So a good example of that is I have some 20Q students who have very strong basics. My wife, for example, her basics are probably better than some single digit Qs. She understands what's happening or what her goal is more than single digit Q players, but she's an 18Q. That's because while she makes a massive area, as soon as her opponent starts pushing in, she doesn't know how to block, she doesn't know how to stay connected, she doesn't know how to watch her cutting points, and everything just falls apart and she can't keep her area. Um, so many players, I think, fall into this category where they might understand what the goal of the turn is, but they can't hold their position or they can't deal with their opponent's moves and everything kind of falls apart, even though they were winning. I think the, there are several players like that as well. So um, I really want to stress don't just do one or the other basics or reading i think you really need to do both and i'm a little bit at fault too because many of my videos always stress the basics and i still think the basics are very very important guys i think they're very important but if you can back it up with reading you'll be so much more powerful and that's basically your execution on the basics how you execute the basics is pretty much reading all right, so let's go ahead and get into the, this first game. I was black and I did have two stones, mostly because the Pandanet system was just plus or minus three stones, and I was just like, all right, let's just get into this. Let's just play a game. I just want to get this video out. So I just started playing games uh, and tried to just see what would happen. And I think my opponent's opening actually was quite well. He, my opponent did quite well for his opening. So here he played here. Normally I recommend like the bottom or the right just to make a combination, but it's no big deal, right? So he immediately came in and made a position on my um, left side, so no big deal there. Here he's attacking me. This is Gote, so I just ignore. Um, and then uh, just make a position, right? So I already have a lead in the opening, but I had two stones, so it doesn't really matter. It's not really what I'm worried about. I'm just uh, seeing how my opponent is. And yeah, the opening can definitely be improved. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a bit, about how to study, how you should be studying, as well as what you should focus on. So first, let's just go into the game. So here you can see his uh, Joseki combination on the left was actually quite good uh, for his level. I think it's not perfect, of course, but we're not trying to play perfect uh, uh, at this level. We're just trying to see that we have a good combination. We're doing something right. Uh, and I think that was uh, quite well here. And here, so black starts to take a serious advantage. That's just because my opening is just faster. So we can start seeing uh, white going for a little bit of a desperation move, but kind of has to, I guess. And... Now we start getting into what are the strengths and weaknesses of a Tin Q. So this person is a Tin Q. No, uh, I was Tin Q's so two stones. I thought it was Tin Q, so it was like 11 Q maybe. I don't know. Uh, I forgot to look. I'm sorry. But it was approximately Tin Q, right? Um, but up to here, up to here, I think White played quite well. I don't really see any gigantic mistakes, right? No major mistakes. A few opening uh, directions can be improved. So yes, the, this player can, uh, can improve his game. But there's no, like, major mistakes, like, nothing that'll cost on the game or nothing that'll give me a significant lead. It's just I've been building up over time. Uh, so here we see the first move that might be questionable, but honestly, white's losing, so I think white needs to do uh, something a little extra in order to uh, make up the difference, right? And I think an invasion might be possible. It might be reasonable. You just have to start fighting and reading. Uh, so while I don't know if this is the best move, I like the idea behind it, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to criticize it, really. And I think a lot of people might criticize this move because there are easier moves, like you can just simply reduce uh, or something. You can um, invade like this, and it'd be a little bit easier. Yeah, so there are better moves, but there are better moves for everything, right? We're not perfect. We're not pro-level players. So I thought this idea was not too bad. Um, but now we're starting to look at the follow-up. So he goes for a base. Cool, cool. And then he tries to run away. Um, and starts trying to make a base, perfectly fine, and he lives. He lives quite well. But here you start seeing the first hint of a, of a problem, because this type of shape is clearly better, right? This is much better for eye shape. So here you can, you can start getting a hint of part of the problem. All right, so I make um, kind of a side, just like you make a myo. And my opponent does play this wedge. This wedge... If your opponent doesn't have to respond, isn't always Sente. So I don't know about this wedge, but I kind of gave it to him because I wasn't really trying anything crazy. Uh, like if I wanted to be crazy, I would be like, okay, let's just keep making it gigantic, right? But I wasn't trying to be crazy. I just wanted to see. I wanted to see what my opponent would do. I have a big area. I'm ahead. There's no reason to be crazy. And then he goes here. Okay, so we see another invasion. 
Um, and invasions aren't particularly bad. It's just invading a lot can be uh, can really lead to a lot of mistakes because invasions don't make you points, right? Invasions are just stealing. They're just taking. They don't make anything. They also don't build anything, which is really important too because your opponent's going to attack you. They're the one that's going to build. So too many invasions can lead to problems, but uh, I can, you can see that White is trying his best to resist the, uh, the Moyo. All right, so I cut, and he starts playing Sabaki. So I thought this idea was quite quite good so the opening ideas and the invasion ideas i think the ideas are single digit q but then we're going to start seeing some really big mistakes here uh, in just a moment so the first kind of uh you can start seeing another hint of this which is shape so he's playing sabaki uh up to here and here you can argue it's still sabaki but this is not connected and this is cuttable. But when I, uh, I actually did try to read this out uh, just to see what would happen. And I didn't like that I couldn't surround perfectly and I thought this was wrong direction. So I just said, okay, you know what? I'm gonna give you that. I'm just gonna give you that. It's something that White should have checked and I honestly don't think he checked it because I think he played it a little fast to check that and read that. Uh, so I just said, okay, I'm just gonna push him towards thickness and surround, no big deal. And then he gets this move, and you can see that this move is going to lead to some problems um, because of the connections here. So I think this is a little bit better. However, when I played here to start po poking the shape, he actually played a very nice uh, shape to Suji here uh, to try and peep. And I really considered if I can uh, cut not or not, but this just seems really strong. And then he could just surround my whole group. And this is where you get into all that reading stuff, right? So I thought this is a very nice move. And then I defended it, right? And I expected him to make shape. And then this becomes blaringly obvious what the first problem is. It's shape, right? So this one, this one, and this one. This is blaringly obvious um, now that there's an empty triangle here instead of the table shape, which is much more solid of a connection and much better liberties, much better all around. Instead, he played in a triangle, which is not nearly as good shape. So the first really big thing, I think, is going to be the shape. And shape isn't just ta memorizing the table shape, the bamboo joint. It's understanding what the shape does. How strong is it a connection shape? Is it an eye shape? <clears throat> Excuse me. Is it a, a sabaki shape? Is it a running shape? Is it a base shape? So a good uh, a good explain a uh, good example is a two space jump on the third line is a base shape. Uh, table shape is eye shape as well as a connection shape. Bamboo joint is a connection shape. Um, a one point jump is a good running shape that can also be considered slightly sabaki depending. Uh, a knight's move is a is an attacking shape. Uh, ex except for something like in the corner with the shimari that's more of an enclosure shape because you're bringing fourth line down the third line so even though it's a knight's move it's not quite the same uh, but a knight's move is attacking shape a hane is attacking shape a cross cut is an attacking shape that disconnects your opponent um, so a disconnection shape uh, and a nobi and uh, is a moving slash um, solid connection shape a diagonal is a solid connection shape that can be used both for defense and attacking um there's just all kinds of shapes guys and you have to understand what the shapes do and when to execute them so understanding shapes especially in attack and defense is going to be so important for this level to get you past to get you to 5q and past 5q because you got to understand how these connection shapes work. You have to understand your connections and you have to understand the disconnections. So your connections and your opponent's connections, your disconnections and your opponent's disconnections. You really have to understand the how you're connected, how your eye space works and how your opponent's connections work and how their eye space works, right? So you really got to understand these things in attack and defense. It's super super important. So here we start seeing the first kind of glaring mistakes. So here, I kind of fix because I don't want to go crazy. Like I said, I'm trying to play a basics game and just surrounding him was good enough. Uh, I'm fine with just surrounding this group. Uh, so I stay connected. He keeps peeping and getting shape, which I think was really good because he needed eye shape, right? Because he's completely surrounded. Then you start seeing this type of move again. How does this help your eye shape? Because uh, again, you're defending. So here you have to have a clear understanding of what you're doing. 
uh, which is the basics. You have a weak group, you want to defend said weak group. You can't escape, so you want to expand your eye space. So there's two basic ideas there. You want to defend the weak group, and you want to expand your eye space. Those are the two basic ideas. So the f first idea he has down, he wants to defend his weak group, so he's trying to defend his weak group. But the second idea, he does not, because that really doesn't help his eye shape. Something that would help his eye shape is maybe something along this line or something along there to start trying to make two eyes or something. But maybe here, uh, if I steal, then maybe he can go back here and just live. And if I try to go here, then maybe he can read and try to make a second eye here or here. But that's where you get into reading, right? There's, this is a life and death problem, practically. The white is completely surrounded, there's no escape, so white needs some forcing moves or some shape moves to try and make the two eyes. And this just isn't gonna cut it. And I also noticed that white was playing quite quickly here. Uh, so I think a lot of people play really fast. Um, and I think the most important place for you to slow down is in the attack and defense stuff. I think it's really important that you slow down in those areas. Um, and I think a lot of players don't. If you can slow down and really, really read and understand what's happening, so understand the goal and read how to accomplish that goal in the attack and defense areas, that alone will probably increase you one rank, maybe even two. So if you really, really slow down, uh, and I don't mean like five minutes per move, no, I mean like minimum 30 seconds per move and maximum like two minutes per move. Just ask yourself, what is the goal of this turn? Is it connection, disconnection, surround, reduce, eye space, expand eye space? What is the basic idea that you can apply here? Then really check the executions. Maybe there's w more than one idea. Maybe there's reduce eye space, and maybe there is surround, um, or maybe there is disconnect. Maybe it's a choice between disconnecting something and surrounding something. Uh, a good example of that is between A and B. So should I Hane and disconnect at A, or should I surround at B? That one requires reading, and I spent a good 30 seconds there um, just trying to figure it out. I mean, I wasn't trying to deep read or anything and spend like two minutes on it, but I, it was a decision that was going to affect the next 10 moves. So I think be, deciding between A and B, surrounding or disconnecting, requires a good 30 seconds um, to a minute. And I think at this level, maybe even two minutes uh, would be required to read, it, to read it out. But I would say every single move in here, you need to spend at least 30 seconds on. Um, Simply because that's a that's at least the biome period. Um, so even if you're in biome, you should spend most of your biome period. You have an infinite amount of those. Um, so I think a minimum of 30 seconds and maximum of two minutes per move. But really, really understand what your basic is and then read the options, read the execution, read if it works or not. And if you can read in these attack and defense situations, you can just win games just in the attack and defense or at least gain a significant lead and have a very solid position. Uh, so I really think you should focus on improving the shapes and the reading and the attack and defense areas. All right, so here I just start reducing eye shape. Uh, this one I just kind of did because I thought I could get some forcing moves out of it. And then he blocked here again instead of something um, like here or here. I would expect to see some tiger's mounts or something, right? Uh, this one kind of leads to a bulky five, you can see, um, and it's not that great. Whereas this one, yeah, I might uh, do that, but these four stones aren't the most important thing in the world. So even if he does something like that, you can start seeing that white's slowly trying to make eye, eye shape here, or something, right? You need to do something to make the eye shape. Eye shape. Uh, and this one I don't think quite cuts it. Uh, just because if if you just read two moves, the sh eye shape is super, super small. All right, so it is this, and I surround. Uh, I could I was, I was, could have poked more to reduce the eye shape, but I knew it was a box four, and this is very important, that you understand the eye shape of groups that are surrounded. So is it a bulky five? Is it a box four? Is it a box six? Uh, is it bent four? Is it uh, the zigzaggy four? Uh, whatever that's called. Um, you need to un really understand the shapes, and you really need to understand the vital points. So that way you can determine if I can just surround and he still only has a shape or I can push. And then from there, you need to take a step further. If I push, is he gonna get forcing moves to still live and then I just lose my profit? If so, then I'll just let him live and get my profit. Um, or is he going to be in a lot of serious trouble and I'll get more profit later? There's a lot of little decisions you have to make, but the first things first, you have to understand what the shape looks like. Then you can start asking yourself, is something better than something else? All right, so here I knew it was a boxy, uh, bulky four, and I played here because of uh, a little bit of reading. 
uh, Ify Hane's here and I want to cut. Uh, there is some cutting Aji here, so he could potentially go here, here, and here. And yeah, it doesn't quite work immediately. But the idea was if something happened and I got cut off, then I wouldn't want this group to be without a connection right here. With that being said, uh, I didn't want this to um, potentially cut me off and uh, be sente. So if maybe example like that and I want to cut him off. Okay, so now I'm uh, cut off and then I didn't want something to happen over here and my whole group get cut off. I wanted a Mii. I wanted a really strong Mii. So that way if he did something like this and I didn't have the stone, say for example I just wanted to Tanuki and he did something like this and I blocked and then he got a lot of forcing moves over here. Um, then I might have Aja here and he might have an eye here and I might not have time to fix it. I don't know. I, I did it for safety. Honestly, if I just write a little bit more, I don't need to. So I think I this is a mistake. But still, that's why I did it. Um, I just did it for safety and security. Here, it is in a triangle, but I'm taking the Tiger's Mouth. Tiger, tiger's Mouth is a strong vital, vital point. Um, yep, all this is fine. And here, at this point, um, yes, uh, I knew I could be disconnected. And the variation for that is will come up. <clears throat> So at this point, I knew it could be disconnected, but I also knew it would be a capturing race. Okay, so I have an option. I can either simply connect and let them live. Right? I can simply connect and let them live. Very safe, right? Or I can kill them. Okay, so this is clearly a life and death problem which leads to a capturing race. So I'll go ahead and show you guys where the capturing race is. See here, he fixes Incente, so I have to block, and then he connects. So you see, I actually did get disconnected here, and that's why I wanted this solid connection. So maybe it wasn't a mistake, I don't know. I don't know, I probably didn't need it, but whatever. Um, but this is what I saw in my head. So I'm like, okay, it's a capturing race. Here is one of the biggest mistakes I see amateur players make um, unless you're in a, unless you're uh, like in tournaments or something they see this and like oh it's a capturing race I want to just connect and let them live that's a very safe plan but before you do that if you read and you're 100% about your solution you can simply count the liberties we learn this at 20 cues and the 20 cues that in a capturing race, you count the liberties and see who plays first, right? We learned that at 20Q. So why is it that when we get to big groups like this, that we become lazy and don't count the liberties? And so I consider just letting him live, but honestly, I thought this would be a good lesson for this video, uh, that if you just count the liberties, how many liberties does white have? All right, so let's just, just take it very simply. One, so, two, so he has to connect. So actually, <laughs> he has to go here. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, so white has three liberties. How many does black have? Okay, so let's uh, pass. Um, dude, dude, let's get our sentient moves in. Maybe we throw in, I don't know, let's get our sentient moves in. One, two, assuming that was sentient. Um, let's start from the other side, because normally you want to start on the outside first, right? So, which means this, yeah, this matters. Okay, whatever. Get your liberty to Suji's in, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't help. Okay. Um, one. So that's two. What am I doing it there? Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Alright? Eight liberties. Eight liberties to three liberties. If it was within one liberty. 
if it was within one liberty and you were reading if you should connect or not and you just couldn't be positive i mean 100 percent positive then i would say okay just take the safe route don't risk the entire game on something you're struggling to read out i think that's probably not a good plan i think you should improve your reading so you can read it out 100 percent next time but it i don't think you should risk the entire game on something you're not 100 percent about but if it's eight to three and you're like five liberties ahead i'm pretty sure if you just take the time take a minute or two here maybe you're not perfect maybe it's plus or minus one or two liberties but i think anyone that actually reads the liberties out and i don't mean just count one by one by one i mean how many moves do you need to play to, to reduce the liberties i think anyone that actually reads the liberties here can potentially find a solution and say who's who's alive and who's dead the trick is doing it right here right the trick is seeing the forcing moves and counting liberties from here this may be quite difficult for many people and i don't expect you to do this immediately okay this is not something i expect a 10q to do it is something i expect a 5q to do so you're wanting to break into single digit cube barrier then this is something you need to start working on working on learning so it's not something you're going to be able to do immediately but it's something i'm going to expect you to do when you're stronger and you're not going to be able to do it if you don't start practicing if you don't start practicing the smaller capturing races if you don't start practicing looking at the eye shapes if you don't start practicing reducing the liberties in, in your reading if you don't start reading then eventually you're going to get to a point where someone's just going to outread you so i think this one is a very good example of just the difference in reading so at this point i think it should be quite obvious who wins the capturing race but white doesn't see it what actually missed a very easy move actually so here i'm just gaining my liberties white played uh when i played here white doesn't even i don't think white even noticed the gravity of this atari um otherwise he would have played a bamboo joint i guess he could didn't have a chance anyway um but you can see that white's still playing the capture race and then white resigned so with that case why didn't white resign right here if he knew what the answer was he would stop and reevaluate the board right here right but it took him one two three four five moves to see he was dead so i knew it like seven or eight moves sooner than he did but i would expect you guys if you're reading to know what five moves before he did so if you can understand what's happening five moves sooner than your opponent can you're gonna have a very significant advantage and i think most people if i just i, I think even 10 cues if i said right here um who's alive who's who's dead i think even 10 cues could figure this out yeah they might struggle with the amount of liberties that black has because of the hane at s16 but if you start counting whites first and you realize how many liberties white has and then you start counting blacks you're gonna be like okay i don't care what white does white doesn't have enough so I think 10 cues can solve this problem from right here. But for some reason, it took white five more moves, arguably 10 moves, you want to count mine too. Uh, it took white five or 10 more moves to realize the same thing that I think if I had asked him outside of a game, he could have solved without playing the extra five moves out. So this is a good lesson right here is you got to read stuff before they happen. Uh, maybe in, in capturing races and liberty races and ladders and stuff, you have to be able to read more than just two or three moves. In an abstract situation, you only need to read two or three moves in their branches. Mm, after 5Q, about five moves in their branches, right? Uh, five moves deep in all their branches. Uh, but in straightforward sequences like this, you've got to learn to read the whole thing through. And it's easier said than done. And it will need practice um, but you got to read the, learn to read the whole thing through all right uh so i actually spent a lot of time on this because i think this is the most important lesson was the attack and defense and the reading i think the reading is the most important lesson here but we do have one more game that i do want to get through really quick so i'm going to go ahead and uh, go through this i was black again and i tried to play very basic and you can see some strange opening moves like here 
It's not even going for the open side, and it's not doing one space away for pressure. So, and then this one. So you can see this player actually had um, a lot of mistakes in the opening. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I actually took a good 20-point lead in the opening. And then here I just went there, and he started going crazy. This is where you start getting the optimistic stuff. But yeah, you're losing, so you got to try something. But then it just went kind of crazy, and the whole thing died. All right, so then he started invaded again. Um, here, tried for life and death. That's good. And then didn't understand life and death shape because that's just um, a box six on the side or a bulky four on the side or even a bulky five. And this is just uh, even worse. This is just a bent three, right? Um, yeah, no matter what, it's bent three. Anyway, here, and I actually gave him a chance to live, and then he didn't read the life and death. He just let me kill him. He didn't even read the life and death. So here is actually quite simple that the opponent didn't even consider the life and death problem and then a lot of optimistic stuff in here. So I think this is a very optimistic move right here. And I say optimistic and this means you're just doing something and hoping everything works out. He's just nuking that group and hoping it's alive. I don't think white read it. Uh, he might have and he might have just misread and if he did then I don't want to hate on him for that because you have to trust your reading. But that also means he needs to improve his reading because I think at single digit Q you got to be able to read this false eye. I I want to say that this is uh, this is ten Q should know this, right? I want to say that, um, but maybe he just misread it. I don't know. So this game, I think it was uh, a lot easier, but it was also an even. But well, no, it was easier than the two stone game, and I had the two stones. Uh, but I think it was because the opponent didn't have a very good setup, and then he just started invading like crazy because he was losing. Um, and there you get into the reading type players. So there's a couple things I want you guys to take from this video. And one is don't forget, don't underestimate the basics, of course. Um, I think you can get to single digit Q with the basics alone. Um, and yeah, with just very little reading, you can get to single digit Q, just be strong and punish simple things. Um, but reading is really important. And I think a lot of people don't take the time to read things out. And then there are those who do take the time to read things out and they're reading the completely wrong things. They're reading how to make points when there's a life and death problem on the right side. Or they're reading the invasions on the top when there's a gigantic area on the right side or maybe there's a life and death problem on the left side. I don't know, right? They're reading the wrong things and you really gotta work on combining both. Um, so I did mention earlier that I would talk about uh, some good habits to have or some study habits or whatever so let's get into some study habits that i think will be very beneficial to you guys uh so the first thing is the shapes i think are very important you got to learn those i think you can get those from reviewing pro games yeah they can be very difficult and very crazy so i don't want you to get too high strong on understanding every single move in a pro game but i would say the first 50 to maybe a first 100 moves i think the game's pretty much um, going into end game by move 100 for pros. I mean, maybe there's still some things to uh, figure out, but I would say just go until the middle game's done, right? Just go until the middle game's done in the pro games, um, and just try to try to figure out where the opening ends. Uh, sorry about my dog, guys. <laughs> He's just barking at cats outside. Uh, hopefully you guys can't hear that too bad. Um, but try to understand where the what are the opening moves, what are the early midi, middle game moves, and what are the late middle game moves. And the differences can be making points, setting a position, and making trades. Early middle game is where the fights start, where the invasions start and stuff. And late middle game is trying to gain that lead for middle uh, for end game or trying to settle those last little fights um, and stuff like that. Uh, so re reviewing pro games, I do recommend re replaying on a real board. It's really helpful to replay the moves on a real board. I think two to four pro games a week is ideal. If you can get four a week, is uh, that would be very ideal for those with day jobs and those who go to school. Um, if you don't and you want to dedicate 10 hours a day, then yeah, you want to do about two to four per day. But if you can do about two to four pro games a week, I think that's very good. Additionally... I think you should be uh, doing a minimum of 25 go problems a day. And that sounds like a lot, but it's only about 30 minutes to an hour if you're doing about your level. Uh, I think 25 go problems can be done in about 30 minutes. 
um, approximately 30 to 40 minutes. So it's just a little bit of time per day. And you don't have to even do them all at once. If you just do five here and there, uh, five at a time here and there, I think it'd be very beneficial to you. So if you do like five when you're in the bathroom or five when you're on the bus or five when you're on, uh, or like 10 when you're on break or something, um, just do like five here, five there, 10 there, and you can easily get to 25 go problems a day. And I think this should be done every single day. Even on your days off, I think you need to do go problems. It really keeps your eyes sharp and on point. Go problems are super beneficial. However, I don't think you should only do life and death problems. I think this is a very common mistake. Go problems are more than just life and death. Sometimes they're squeeze to sujis, uh, sometimes they're surrounding, sometimes they're connections, uh, sometimes there's sh liberty shortage, uh, sometimes uh, there are life and death problems. So there are many types of problems. And um, I think if you guys don't have access to those, then send me a message or something uh, on our Discord group. I have a bunch of links to many problems. Uh, or ask your friends, ask on online somewhere on a forum. Just ask for life and death problems. Oh, sorry, ask for go problems and then ask for good life and death problems and then good non-life and death problems, right? You need to do both. And I think doing about 25 a day is very, very good for you. Uh, and last but not least, two games a day, guys. At least five days a week, okay? Uh, I understand if you want to play this game for fun, that's completely fine, completely cool, all right? Play this game for fun, play correspondence, whatever you want to do have fun and I think that's great but if you're trying to improve at a decently steady pace I think two live games a day five days a week so it's about ten games a week um, and don't just do five games one day five games another day because that gives you five days that you're not playing go I think that's not beneficial um, if you can do five games in one day and then like two games a every other day or something that that's cool too that's more than 10 games a week but i think 10 games a week kind of spread throughout the week so that way you get a lot of practice uh throughout the week uh is ideal for those with day jobs and they go to school two games a day it's about an hour maybe hour and a half of playing it's not that much for someone wanting to improve at a decently fast pace if you look at uh, i'm sure many of you know about video games and pro gamers and video games ask yourself how much top gamers play video games per day they probably play like 10 to 12 hours a day of that game right and if you want to ask professional go players how much they um spend on the game they spend eight to ten hours maybe even 12 hours per day studying go so you got even if you want to improve at a decently slow but steady pace you still gotta put in uh, at least a couple hours a day right um at least a few hours a week so I think with that, uh, I think the study habits should be two to four pro games a week, 25 go problems a day, two games, live games, probably like 15 to 20 minutes per side uh, per day. And then of course, review those games that you play and replay them, like replay them and try to figure out what was good, what was bad. Did you accomplish the basics? Don't focus too much on fine tuning it perfectly. Just try to learn one thing from every game, maybe two things from every game. Uh, if you can learn one or two things or one or two concepts from every game and just try to do better next time, it's perfectly fine. Don't spend like longer than 15, 20 minutes reviewing your game. I think it's a, a little bit of a waste of time after that point. Um, so I think that would be beneficial. Uh, another good tip for improving is improving your opening. I think you should research an opening and then play that opening for uh, 10 to 20 games in a row and then review pro games with that opening. So a good website for that is um, uh, ps.wall theory. I believe you can just Google that, ps.wall theory. Um, I don't know how to give a link to that <laughs> in a YouTube video, uh, but it looks like the this, yeah, see ps.walltheory.net. Uh, so ps.walltheory.net, hopefully you guys can pause the video and search that. Um, this is basically a pattern searching database, and I'll switch the this pattern searching database like that. You can replay, play an opening, just pick an opening, be like, okay, I want to do star point and three, four point, okay? And you just go over here and look at the pro games and review only pro games with that opening until you've got that opening at least decently down. So you know what Joseki's happened in that opening. You know how the Joseki direction works. You know what your goal is for that opening. You know what options you have in that opening for different types of moves. 
uh, and just review pro games with your opening. This is how you learn openings and this will help your pro games help your game even more, right? So I think this is uh, really beneficial to um, kind of making your study time efficient as you stick to reviewing pro games. <clears throat> you stick to reviewing pro games that help your opening as well. Uh, and then of course you can review the latest pro games on gokifu.com. Let's see. Go Kifu, yeah, gokifu.com. If you just want to see what the latest patterns are or the latest openings are, you can go to gokifu.com and they pretty much get games updated daily. So I think those are also really good. But anyway, so that's for studying. With that being said, I don't think that is what you should focus on. <laughs> I think that's what you should be doing. But what you should focus on to break into single digit Q is really work on your combination patterns uh, just make them basic and simple and then focus on the attack and defense in the middle game like the early middle game really focus on understanding what your goal of every turn is and then reading how to accomplish that goal you're not going to do it perfectly i don't want you to do it perfectly i want you to do it good for your level and i want you to be putting in genuine effort uh into improving your moves and improving your reading and improving your understanding of the goal of the basics. Uh, if you do that, I think that is how you can break into single digit Q over time. And I think uh, a good method of measurement, do, do I really hate doing this because it can always vary per person, but a good measurement is if you're improving one rank per month, playing 10 games a day and doing all that, if you're improving one rank per month, you're doing quite well, all right? If you're improving one rank every two months, then I also think you're doing quite well. That just might be um, you getting rid of bad habits. That might be you understanding new concepts and maybe you're struggling to understand this type of game. It's okay. There are people who improve slower than others. There are people that improve faster than others. If you're improving one rank every three months, I do recommend... Uh, checking how much you're putting into it if you're if it takes you about three months to improve one rank try to really think about how many hours a week are you actually putting into this game it's usually players are either a not putting in enough effort and to get something back that you're not putting in enough to get something back or b there's something you're really struggling with and just not understanding and at that point i think you should ask for advice ask others to review your games ask for lessons or get lessons or something um, because I think one rank every three months at double digit Q to single digit Q, uh, is considered a little bit slow. I don't want to be too negative guys. Cause I know some people might actually be improving at that rate and they're doing the best they can. I don't want to say that you're not putting in enough effort. I don't want to say that you're just not talented. That's completely false. I just want to say that maybe there's something you're struggling with. Um, or maybe you aren't putting in a, uh, as much effort as you think you are. And you might want to just start writing out, uh, writing down how much you actually do put in per week. Um, or maybe you're, maybe you have a bad habit and it needs to break. I don't know. Uh, every person's different and there's no one set of improvement rates for everyone. Okay. The, everyone improves at their own rate. And I do believe everyone can get to one dot. Okay. I don't, I think there's different, uh, amounts of time it takes to get to one dot, depending on the person, but I do believe everyone can get to one dot. I really want to help you guys get to one dot. So if you have any questions about anything I've said, uh, do leave a comment, uh, in the comments below or message me on discord. If you haven't joined my discord yet, uh, be sure to check that out. It is on my website, seansgogroup.com. It's on the homepage. You can join our discord and ask questions in there. Uh, there's also the OGS forums. Uh, you can ask for a lot of help there and the OGS in and of itself. <clears throat> there's many places that you guys can get advice. Go kibitz.com even. You can uh, post your game records and get people to review your games um, within like 48 hours, pretty much. So there's so much material for you guys uh, and so many people that are willing to help. So I do believe everyone can get to one don and I do believe everyone has the talent to get to one don. Maybe not everyone has the talent to get to seven on or eight don, but I do believe everyone can get to one don. It's just a matter of time and effort, right? Maybe some people need more effort than others. That's true. There is there is talent, but it's not talent that prevents you from getting to one don. It's how much you put into it. Maybe if you're not talented, maybe you need to put in more effort than others. That's perfectly fine. Or maybe it'll take you longer. Maybe it takes you two years or three years. 
Um, and some people it takes one year or some stupidly talented people it takes six months. I don't know. But everyone can do it. It's just a matter of time and dedication, right? Go is a big thing. It requires dedication to improve and dedication and effort. But I do think all of you guys can do it. If you say you can't, I disagree. I think you're just not putting in enough effort. <laughs> everyone can do it. Um, it just, you have to put in uh, effort for long enough periods of time. All right, uh, I do hope that you guys found that beneficial. Uh, some other maybe little notes that I think are beneficial to you guys is exercise will really, physical exercise, I think will really help you guys. Um, if you do go problems before you play every day, like if you do your 25 go problems as warm up and then you play your games, I think it's beneficial. Do not stress over losses. I really think this is a big mental um mental problem with uh, a lot of people have and everyone goes i think a lot of people go through this phase where they get scared of losing and that is so wrong so bad losing is so big in this game you're expected to lose half the time and sometimes more than half the time to improve okay you have to understand that losses are very beneficial to your improvement as long as you are not stressing about them don't stress about losses just try to learn from them you are expected to lose a lot to improve so do not stress about losses. Do not stress about deranking. Your rank is not that important. Trust me. It's your weekly results that you want to think about. You do not want to think about every single game as uh, how as a reflection of your skill. Okay, every single game is not a reflection of your skill. Every twenty games is probably a reflection of your skill. Like how you how many uh, games did you win or lose against a ten Q? out of 20 games okay that is a reflection of your skill and accept it if you're weaker than a 10q and you thought you were stronger than a 10q it's okay maybe you're learning something or maybe you just had a misunderstanding or maybe this server has gotten stronger who knows just don't stress over it don't attack yourself don't be like oh i suck at this game uh or i know i'm stronger than this that's really bad mentality to have sometimes uh, I even tell myself, like, I am, I'm i 4 on on Foxway Chi, and I'm 5 on on Tai Jim, but sometimes I get on a losing streak, and I tell myself, oh, I'm just a 1 Don, or I'm a 1Q, and then I'll just let myself derink to that, just to take the stress off my so shoulders, and then work my way back up, and sometimes it even gives you uh, a little bit of motivation, because then you work your way back up, and you rank back up, um, and that rank back up triggers uh, some, you know, positive emotions, and be like, oh, cool. Now I've ranked up, I've leveled up, now I'm doing great, now I can keep going. Uh, sometimes it really helps. And sometimes uh, if you don't rank up, then you're like, oh, okay, so maybe I just had a misunderstanding and I'm not as strong as I thought I was. Cool, well now I am, and now I should stop losing every single game uh, and maybe I can win every now and then. Uh, so don't, don't stress yourself out, don't attack yourself, guys. This is a very common mistake that will really hold you back. Don't do it. This game is supposed to be fun. This game, be encouraging to yourself. Uh, be don't attack yourself. Just be encouraging to yourself and uh, tell yourself that you can do it. Tell yourself it's okay to lose. It's not that big of a deal. It's more of a big deal that you attack yourself. That will slow you down more than losing ten games in a row. Okay, don't attack yourself. Just have fun. If you have fun, you will win eventually. You'll eventually de rank, find some, face weaker opponents. You'll win eventually. Um, so don't worry about it. Losing is okay. Uh, another piece, another note, I guess, is uh, try to play your rated games with people plus or minus one rank. Um, don't go more than two ranks unless you just really need a game and no one's on, and that's fine. Uh, don't be afraid of handicap if you're facing stronger players because you still want the chance to win, and if you lose, you won't understand what you did that caught that. Even with handicap, what did you do that cost you a victory? Um, don't play rated games. You can play teaching games with people stronger than you. Okay, don't let, don't let uh, me discourage you from that. But don't play rated even games with people several ranks stronger than you, um, because it's very discouraging, and it's not. It's not. You're not going to learn as much. Uh, from that game as you'll lose from the discouragement unless it's a teaching game okay unless you know that you're gonna lose rated games you want to try to win and it also will negatively affect your rank which can also potentially negative affect the outlook for some people 
Um, and I don't think that's true. And also, there's also the types of players that sometimes they get lucky and they beat someone three ranks stronger than them in one once or twice, and then they think that they're that level. And that is completely false. Like I said, it's a measurement of like 20 games. One game is not a measurement of your skill. Um, so there's a lot of little things that you can do to potentially um, help you uh, psychologically and whatnot. But anyway, hopefully you guys found all my little notes helpful. Hopefully you guys found this video inspiring and helpful to improving your go skill and breaking into that single digit barrier. And maybe I even help some single digit players out there that uh, were struggling with some stuff. and Or maybe um, I help some people learn how to study. I don't know. I just hope I, I was able to help a lot of you guys out. Uh, this video is pretty much my apology for not getting the other videos out last month. That is why it's so long and I tried to stick as so much content into it. I wanted to get a lot of stuff out to you guys and I kind of, uh, I kind of struggled with that last month. So hopefully this video makes up for it. But as always guys, thanks for watching. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. Um, leave any questions you have in the comments below. And if you haven't already, like and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Adios.